Hello everyone, um, we'll get started since um, we are right on time. So first of all, um, welcome. This is our first Back to Basics series um, organized by the Young Scientists of the Control Release Society. And I'm Shantani, so I'll be hosting this event. Um, just a few housekeeping rules. Um, I've ensured that all participants are muted, um, just for obviously the quality of the presentation. Um, Please also make sure your videos are turned off um, throughout the presentation. If you have any questions, you can bring this up using the chat function. Um, we do have moderators um, who are Max and Jamie. They would help answer your questions during the presentation. If there's any other questions um, that could not be answered by the moderators, we would pile them up for um, Linda, our presenter, to. Uh, um, to answer them at the end of the presentation. Um, so just a bit more about ourselves in case you have not heard of us. Um, so like I said, we are the Young Scientists Committee of the Controlled Release Society. Um, so basically we represent a group of um, PhD students or early career scientists in the academia or industry. Um, we are quite a diverse group of um, scientists, so currently we are we represent 30 countries around the world and we'll love to have more people on board with us. Um, we do organize a lot of um, networking events, scientific workshops, as well as professional development and um, provide career opportunities for young scientists all around the world. Um, so do follow us on our social media. Um, and like I said, uh, we are part of the Control Release Society, which is a bigger um, group of scientists um, worldwide. Um, so you can uh, please do consider joining us as a member. You can look up our web page or our social media for more information. Um, and like I said, this is the first Back to Basic series that we are organizing as the Young Scientist Committee. And there's many more um, that we would love to organize. So have um, please keep out for more information on social, uh, social media. Um, just to add on as well, the Control Release Society is organizing a virtual annual meeting this year. Um, so more details would be up on the web page as well as our social media. So like, again, um, like I said, just consider um, joining us as well as this connects a lot of um, scientists around the drug delivery and research space. Without further ado, I would pass this um, on to Linda um, to start her presentation. So Linda is a postdoc at University of Freiburg in Switzerland, and she's going to give us um, an introduction on Adobe Illustrator. All, it's all yours, Linda. Thanks for the introduction, Stephanie. All right. So we shall begin on lesson one on Adobe Illustrator basics and some tips on effective figure design. So this class will be just to introduce you to some basic tools and functions of Adobe Illustrator. I understand when you first open up this program, it can be quite uh, complex and overwhelming, but I'm here to demystify that, give you a couple of tools to get you started on your graphic design journey. And a disclaimer that um, I'm no professional at this, um, but I have been using Illustrator and Photoshop since I was a kid making dumb graphics, but I've developed a lot of competence over the years and that's helped me a lot during my PhD. So we've got a lot to get through during this hour, so we'll uh, get started. Right. So some basic theory on figure design. We as scientists, are also artists in that we're communicating our interpretation of our research in the form of a paper or scientific um, posters or figures to a wider audience who may include reviewers or our peers. And the way to judge if figures are effective is if you look at only the figures within a, um, within a uh, paper, uh, you should be able to understand the research outcome and the story of it all without even having to read the text. So these figures need to be clear and easy to understand and designed in a way that they don't mislead or confuse your audience, whether it's intentional or not, because that's definitely unethical. 
So there are a whole host of factors, practical factors that you need to take into account in order to um, develop these, uh, construct your uh, effective figures. Um, and I'll link you guys to a resource at the end. However, in my opinion, the two uh, most important ones that you need to consider are the, lace, uh, the layout and the balance, which is basically the organization of your data. So you want to arrange your figures in a way of the elements within your figure in a way that they're neat and it's logical and it makes sense. And you also don't want to overcrowd your figure with too much information that it would overwhelm your reader and cloud the message that you're trying to deliver. And then you also want to have it clearly labeled so that it provides a bit more context. And then the second factor is perhaps more aesthetic, including the color, shapes, and patterns. And these are perhaps more, uh, and they also serve a functional role in that, let's say one of your reviewers might be colorblind. If they can't differentiate between uh, two different data sets, well then the message that you're, uh, the um, conclusion that you're trying to convey, they, don't, they can't fully understand that. Um, and so that's to your detriment as well. And so we can effectively use shapes and patterns to differentiate data. And with colors, you can use it to highlight um, certain elements to add emphasis to um, your work. Um, but the main key points that I want you guys to take away is that you wanna keep your figures simple and clean. Less is more. So don't overcrowd it with too much um, detail um and then you want to keep it consistent so like i said previously uh your figures they should tell a story but if each different figure in your paper has a different font size a different um uh font uh style and then let's say you colored uh, this drug a as blue in one figure and then you suddenly color it um a darker blue in another one it, it loses that continuity. So you want to keep it consistent so that it's easier to follow for your readers and they're not uh, and then they don't get confused. All right, jumping into Adobe Illustrator. What is it? It's a program that designers use to generate high quality images. So in the context of science, we can make scientific posters, schematics and figures, and even business cards for when we go out networking. And to make these high quality images, Illustrator works with points and vectors. Without going into too much of the jargon, um, I can demonstrate, uh, uh, demonstrate it for you in these figures in this figure here. So if you use Photoshop or perhaps you're more familiar with Microsoft Paint, when you have a circle and you want to resize it to something larger, you get this pixelation around the edges, which makes it blurry and, lose, uh, and decreases the quality of the whole image. But in Illustrator, your circle is actually made up of four points. So I've got an example here. Um, these are the four points that make up this circle. And when I resize it, it maintains that quality because these four points maintain that same uh, distance uh, proportionally. And Illustrator knows to just redraw the line uh, based on those four points. And that's how it retains its resolution. Pretty neat, right? All right? So getting started with Adobe Illustrator. When you first open it up, uh, you'll be greeted uh, with a screen that um, allows you to pick your canvas size. Uh, there are some presets uh, which you can use. Um, otherwise, you can press a cu the custom size button, which will lead you to this window here. Um, it's easier to work with larger artboard sizes or canvas, canvas or artboard sizes um, get, as you've got more sp space to play around with. And so this settings page, uh, you can customize the file name, the file dimensions. And if you press on the advanced options here, it'll open up an extra set of settings. So you can change the color mode here, including CMYK, which is appropriate for printing. But I usually choose this setting anyway, because whichever color you choose now, you'll see it on the screen anyway, and you can predict what the colors will look like on someone else's screen. Uh, if you choose uh, the other option is RGB. This is only appropriate for screens. Um, so like on your computer screens right now or on a TV, this is the option that you choose. Um, and these colors are generally a lot brighter and more saturated than the CMYK colors. 
However, if you do go to print um, any RGB uh, colour schemes, then uh, it's unpredictable uh, what colours you'll get and they may not be to your liking. Finally, you can also set the uh, raster effects, which is basically the resolution of the files that you save at the end, whether it's in JPEG or TIFF or PNG. Um, standard, uh, you can pick 300 ppi. However, some journals will ask for 600 ppi and you can set that here. Uh, the thing is, if you do set it to 600, it will severely increase the size of your file and some journals will um, have a limit to the file sizes you can upload. So you have to look uh, balance up the, between the quality and the canvas size at the end. Canvas size or file size. All right. So as I previously mentioned, uh, Illustrator works with points and you need to make the points to begin with. There are a couple of tools here on this left-hand navigation bar that can help you generate these tools. So first you've got this pen tool. This one makes point to point to point um, uh, custom shapes. So if I click here for my first point and I keep moving around, uh, I'll make some shapes, right? Uh, to actually close it, I will click on the first point that I made and then this little circle will pop up on my cursor and then now it's closed. Um, so this is my irregular shape and it's weirdly colored. So I'm just going to change it a bit. We'll get back to the color and stuff later. Um, so this is one of the shapes that I can make with this pen tool. Notice how I've also got these um, letters on the side. Um, Illustrator works with a lot of keyboard shortcuts and there's quite a lot. You don't have to remember them all, but the more common tools that you use, um, you will familiarize yourself with them and it'll get easier to know which ones um, that will help you out later on. Um, next, you can use the line tool. So if I click on this button here, I can pull a line tool anywhere. For now, it has free reign on the angle um, where it can go. But if I hold down the shift key as well, it will lock it to um, just the more common angles. So like vertically up and 45 degree angles. So there's that. Oops. And you need to keep holding on to it after you release. So there's my line tool. And let's say I want to add, um, this is the paintbrush tool, which allows me to freehand any lines or curls that I need. Uh, and after that, um, Illustrator will convert these to points. So here is, let's pretend this is my drug molecule or drug particle, and I've functionalized it with some polymer brush. Strange, but that's just how it is. Um, and now we can make shapes as well. So here, there's just the square. However, if I click and hold, I'm opening a new menu of other different shapes I can choose. So there's the ellipse tool here, which I've selected, and I can make perhaps a ellipse. But if I also want to make a perfect circle, I can hold down the shift key, click and drag, and it'll make a perfect circle. So there's that. Now, if I also want to make a polygon or a triangle, so this is where the tool that you would use to make a triangle, I would click it. By default, I think the setting is to make a hexagon. However, if you want to change this, um, you would, I'm going to delete this, and uh, I would have this polygon tool selected and then I would just click on anywhere on my canvas size, click it once. This dialog box will show up asking me how many sides I want to pick. So a triangle has three sides, so I can change it here. But you can change it to any number you want, as long as it's larger than three. You can change the radius now, or you can um, leave it up to a bit later. So here's my triangle. Now I've kind of got all my shapes ready. I want to move them. To move them, I have the option of two selection tools. This first one allows me allows me to select individual objects. Or if I want to group them, I would select this 
uh, object and let's say I want to select uh, this brush, this polymer brush and this polymer brush. Now I can group them by pressing Control G. Now it acts as one whole object that I can just um, manipulate as a whole. If instead I wanted to um, manipulate one object of this group or perhaps um, a point within this group, I can also do that. So I would click the direct selection tool and then I would, I'm going to zoom in now. So notice how this squiggle actually has a whole lot of white points. I can move the curvature of this, for example. So when it's highlighted blue, that means it's active. These white ones will remain fixed where they are. So if I want to move this one now, I can click on that and switch that over however much I want. So this white tool is very useful. However, it does take a bit of getting used to which uh, the white one or the black one that you need for manipulating which element of your objects. Right. So now I'm just going to pick the selection tool and I'm going to select all of these so that I can move it over to a cleaner canvas and show you a bit more functionings. Or you can highlight them as well. Right. Now they're over here and it's a bit more clearer to see. I'm going to move this triangle I'm going to resize this triangle and to do that, I would still on the selection tool, I would hover my cursor so that it's over one of these white boxes here. And I've got these um, two headed arrows. So I can resize it by doing this, uh, by clicking and dragging. And then I'm going to click and move it over to over here, for example. Another keyboard shortcut is I can um, duplicate this by holding the Alt key. So holding the Alt key after I've selected an object will, and hovering over it, you'll see that my cursor is actually duplicated. You've got the white and the um, black arrows here. If I click and hold now, I've made another copy of my triangle. And if I hold down the Shift key as well, so this is the Alt, click, um, drag and shift, it will uh, maintain the alignment. So let's say I want to leave it there. Well, shape that done now. Now I'll head back over here. And then the other tool that's extremely useful for this is if I want to consolidate all my shapes into one, this handy tool, the Shape Builder tool, uh, can easily do that for us. So basically, it can combine or subtract shapes from. Moving back over here, I will have my selection tools um, activated and I'm going to shift click to combine these two shapes, yeah? So both of these shapes are individual, but they're both in the same selection now. So if I click onto the shape builder tool, which is over here, I've got a plus sign on my cursor. That means if I drag and draw that weird line, between these two shapes, anything that's shaded will be merged. Now I will release my mouse and this has become one shape now. I'm gonna go back to the selection tool and select these two objects. I will go back to the shape builder tool. And now let's say I want to subtract this triangle from this uh, shape now. I would press the Alt key Press and hold the Alt key, and you'll see that the plus sign is now a minus sign. Again, I will drag my mouse over this section, and this highlighted region will be subtracted from the um, weird irregular shape. So that's how it looks like now. Finally, uh, the other tool that you can use to kind of finish it all off is the type tool, and this allows you to add labels and paragraphs of information to your data. So we'd click that, click on your screen, 
drag a box. This is where your text will go. This is just um, Latin that's usually used for um, a design and it's by default. Uh, you would delete that and let's just say substrate enzyme. And from here, you can highlight it and you can alter the the uh, font family, which is, you can pick Arial times New Roman, whichever one you want. Generally, Arial and any other sans serif font is um, acceptable. You can also change the, um, the style. By default, it should be regular. Uh, avoid using italics, bold, and any other option because these do make it more difficult to read. Um, they're only uh, used sparingly for emphasis. And then finally, you can also choose the font. Sorry, the control is over the top of this. Um, yes, you can finally choose the font size. So whether you want it larger or smaller. And then if you want the alignment, you would select paragraph and you can go left, center or right aligned. And there's different types of justified as well, but you can play around with those. If in doubt with um, Illustrator on what certain buttons do, you can always ho hover over the top of them and a little label will show up describing what these buttons do. And if you're still unsure, just click it. If it's not to your liking, just go back to the original as well. So once you're done with um, setting up your text, you just press Control Enter and your um, text is complete as an object. If you need to edit it again, just press on the T um, or the text button and then click on top and you can type it in again. So now I'm going to press Control Enter to lock it in. Um, it brings me back to the uh, selection tool, which also allows me to resize this box if need be. So if I want it all in one line, I can do that too. Yeah, so that's enough for this section. We'll move on now to adding colors to our images. So you can do this by um, selecting your object and then going over down here. Each object has two different elements to it um, in terms of color. You've got the fill, which is the internal um, color of the um, object, and then the outline, which is basically the stroke color. Um, currently, the fill is activated because it's on top. If I click on the stroke one, this one comes on top and whichever color I pick now um, is going to be applied to the stroke. You also have three options here. You have color, which is basically a solid color, gradient or none. So this is transparent film. Um, we won't go into the gradients today, but I'll just show you how to color it with a solid color or make it, um, what do you call it? Moving back over here, I will select my object. Currently, it's got a blue stroke and no fill. I'm going to select this no fill and I'm going to move it to the solid color. And to change the color, I would double click this box. There are other ways to do this and you'll find out more and more uh, ways as you play around with it. But uh, for now, the easiest way is you just double click any of these boxes to change the color. So here you have a map of choosing whether you want it light or dark, uh, saturated or unsaturated. And if you want to change the hue, you can slide this um, bar up and down to change it to red, yellow or whatever. So for now, I want a nice bright green and I'm gonna click OK. I'll click on the fill color because I don't like the blue and I'm gonna change it to black. And that's how it is. So like I mentioned previously, you can also add, change the um, add patterns in order to allow you to differentiate data. Um, so let's say you had different uh, columns in your bar graph, you can change um, each uh, one set of columns to make it a different pattern just so it's easier to differentiate. Um, to actually open this, uh, you would find your swatch tab. If you do not have this swatch tab available to you, you can go to the window um, menu and then 
This is much like any other tab that you have here. If you don't have it, it's always in the window. So you go to window and then you scroll down until you find swatches and you select that and it will show up. So from here, you would go to these three bars, which is more options, open that up, go to your open swatch library. And then from there, you would find patterns, which is here. You can choose any of these that you want, but I'm going to choose the basic graphics to begin with, and then I'll pick textures. This box will show up and I will head back over to our shapes. And I'm going to select uh, this object. If now I press to apply a pattern, I will just select the object and then click one of these. But notice how it only applies to the stroke. That's because the stroke here is activated. I'm going to press Ctrl Z to undo that. If in fact I wanted to redo that, um, I would press Ctrl Shift Z. Yeah. Yes, Ctrl Shift Z. Um, this is unlike many other programs which you use Ctrl Y. If you find yourself uh, accidentally pressing Ctrl Y, then you, your whole screen's gonna look like this and you might start panicking, but don't worry, just press Control Y again and it'll revert it back to what you had previously. So if I want to apply the pattern to the inside of this shape, I would select um, the fill so that comes up on top and then I would select this again. But see, notice I have colored in my uh, brush strokes as well. And I don't really want that. That's because this whole entire group is um, being applied the same um, settings or the same fill color and the same stroke color. So in order to undo this, um, fix this, I'm going to undo it and I'm going to ungroup it as well. So now they're all individual elements while I click on the selection tool. So selecting only this object, I will now click on the pattern again and voila. I've colored in this uh, shape. So I'm just gonna click and group it again by Control G. And once again, it's one object. Yeah. So these are your patterns and colors. And you can mess around with that to your aesthetic likings. All right. The next element that you can uh, modify with your uh, shapes and objects is the stroke. So basically strokes are the outlines and you can modify the thickness of the strokes um, and if you want dashed lines or arrows. And you do that by going to the stroke tab, which again, if you go to window and stroke, it will be there too. So there's a whole host of options that you can change, including the weight or the thickness of your lines. And this can range from decimal numbers to however thick you want, 100 points, 200 points, whatever. Uh, you can modify the cap, so the alignment of the outline uh, relative to the point, and then corners if you want rounded or sharp, and then the alignment of the stroke uh, relative to the actual line. And then there's the dashed lines and we'll go over to the other screen soon. But if you find that you don't have all these settings, if you click on this button here, you'll toggle through the different menus. So here's a more basic one where you only have it up to the dashed lines. Click it again, you'll only have the, um, the weight showing. You click it again, it'll disappear altogether. And I'm just gonna have it all open for you guys to see. So heading back over to this, we've got our line already prepped from previously. I'm going to increase this number, the weight of the line to five, um, five points. And I might want to stretch it out a bit, holding the shift key to keep it in alignment. And I'm going to add a dashed line. By default, it will come up as just 12. So by default, it'll just be 12 points, meaning there's a 12 point gap, a 12 point dash, and a 12 point gap repeated. 
Um, I can also decrease the length of my gap to let's say three, for example. So now it's a bit tighter. And then if I want to alternate it, so like dots and dashes, I can make this one five and then I would need to make this one three as well. And it's a bit more even. So this is a really good tool if you want to differentiate between different lines in a line graph, for example. Um, if your graphing software doesn't already do that, this can help you. So now I want to also convert this to um, an arrow. I would select my graph using the selection tool, head over to the arrowheads down here and then select which style of arrowhead I'd like. By default, I usually go for number seven. Notice how it's pretty big relative to the actual weight of your line. You can now um, scale it down to a more appropriate value, which is somewhere around 30. And that's how it is. Um, you can also change the alignment. So where this base of the arrowhead can go, so it can go where the tip aligns with the um, end point of your line or the edge of that goes to the other end, like that. So there's different options and there's a whole lot of ways that you can customize all of this um, if you just play around with it. Um, otherwise, there's always Google. Like a lot of these things, there's a great community of um, Illustrator um, soft resources online that you can just go on and ask around and they're generally very helpful people. So that was a little basics on strokes and lines. Moving on to a few tips and how to bring it all together with um, some effective um, figure designs. So there's padding. And I've always mentioned this to um, anyone who gives me their work to um, critique. And padding is very important because that's basically the white space or the negative space around all your elements. So pretty much this space here, this space here and all that. And it allows you the page to breathe and it also allows your eyes to easily see where the data is flowing. So with this page, for example, I know that I start from this top left and I move down and then I move over here, right? And there's different tools that Illustrator has um, that allows you to more easily um, organize your data so that it looks neat and clean. So you've got the automatic um, alignment. So let's say I've got uh, two shapes. I'm going to draw two rectangles, for example. I'm going to get rid of this dashed line. And I've got two um, squares now. So if I want to move this square, Zoom in a bit. Right. I'm going to fill the square. There we go. Doesn't quite work with this one. I will uh, take you to the other screen in a little bit to show you these pink lines. But anyways, there's also the control G, which I previously mentioned, where you can group multiple objects together. So control G, that's one object now, and it allows you to more easily manipulate them. And then finally, there's the align tools. So if you go over to this align tab here, again, if it doesn't show up, go to window, and then you find align, which is up here, all alphabetically ordered. So you click that, and this menu will show up. So if you select two or more objects, or groups of objects, you can align them relative to the right edge, uh, the center, or the left edge of these objects. Otherwise, you can also align it to the top, middle, and bottom uh, edge. And then if you select three or more objects, you can evenly distribute them so that there's even spacing between um, each of these objects, whether it's according to the, uh, vertic uh, the top line, the middle line or the baseline, and again, the left line, um, uh, the center line or the right line. So I will now demonstrate with this uh, image here, um, how to put this into action. 
So here I've got nine different separate objects which are very poorly aligned. To get started in aligning them, I can click on the selection tool, shift, hold the shift key and select these three and I want to align them to the topmost edge. That's it. Now they're all aligned according to that baseline, uh, that line there. For the middle row, I want to align it to the center. And for the bottom row, I'm going to align it to the baseline. It's not quite there yet, as you can see. So we've only done the rows. Now we can do the columns. Again, I will select the first column and I'll have it center aligned using this button here. And I will repeat that for the next two. So shift, click, shift and click. So now I've got three rows and three columns of neatly aligned um, objects. However, it doesn't quite look there yet. So notice how you've got this gap here, which looks a lot thicker than this gap. To do this, I would need to use the grouping function. So I would again select these columns and press Control G to group. Now this is treated as one object. I can do the same for these objects and the same for this one. Now I have three objects to work with. I'll select all three of them now. So shift, click, click and go down to the distribute objects buttons and I will select distribute um, horizontally center. So now the gaps between these uh, three columns are equidistant. It still doesn't fix the uh, issue with the rows. And to do that, I will need to ungroup all of these. So I'm gonna select them all again and just press control shift G. That will separate it all and I have nine individual objects once again. In the case of rows, I'll need to highlight entire rows and group them. So highlight and press Control G. So you can either press Shift and click or just highlight and um, select to select them all. So now I've got three rows worth of um, figures. I'll select them all once again and go over to here to select the uh, vertical distribute center. So it's finished now, but it doesn't look quite right. So this one still looks a bit thicker than this gap here. So it could be that because I've got these irregular shapes here that um, Illustrator can't really find uh, that it's just going by the center lines of these and distributing it via that way without a care for these gaps. But if I perhaps press the vertical distribute bottom, now it looks a little better. This gap here looks kind of equidistant to this gap over here. So that's possible. Now I've pretty much aligned all nine of my figures and I can add in my labels and properly um, uh, fix it up for my final figure. But that's pretty much all the alignments. Um, I'm going to ungroup this and I'll show you the pink lines that I was referring to. Okay, they're not showing up for some reason, but they will align. So this center line will usually align with this center so that you know that it should um, click and all that. But I'll let you know when we do see it again. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. We haven't quite figured it out yet. But we'll get back to that. All right. So those are some skills that you can, oh, wait, no. Going back to this one. All right, here is a real life example of a figure that was published in um, Nature. And as you can slowly come to realize, it's made up of three sections. You've got part A, part B, and part C. And you've got imaging figures, uh, column graphs of two different types of data. It's quite uh, crammed because there's a lack of negative space and it's hard to follow and compare between each type of data set. But here, um, Aora Zabala has actually cleaned it up a bit and reorganized it in a way that you've got columns of your different parts, so part A, part B, part C, 
And then all your imaging data is grouped in the rows. And the uh, all the graphs, the column graphs, um, are based, uh, are organized in their rows. Um, however, I mean, it's okay, but it could do with a bit more improvement. You do have a bit of redundant information here. So you've got repetition of these legends, which is the same for all of these rows. And also some of the labeling to help you uh, guide your eye to see where, um, how things are organized. So the next step was to delete all the excess uh, legends and then add in the labels. So before these labels were down here and they weren't in bold, but now they've moved up here. And it's easier to see that this all applies to the primary tumor. This all applies to metastasis. And overall, it looks a lot cleaner and easier to understand um, the data if you're more familiar with this kind of work. But yeah, these simple steps and tips um, you can apply to your own work and it will um, drastically improve the readability and accessibility of, your, um, of the message that you're trying to convey. So, moving on to the next slide. Right. So, another useful thing with Adobe Illustrator is that you can combine um, different types of um, data from various different software. So for example, if you made graphs in Excel and then had some chemicals that you drew in ChemDraw, and then you wanted to combine this all into one figure, you can do that via Adobe Illustrator. So if you just copy and paste direct from those software, uh, you can actually edit individual elements in this. So it's all a group now. I'm going to select over to the direct selection tool and I'll show you that you can rename this cell line A to cell line C, for example, or you can change the color of um, these graphs. So if you want to apply a pattern like I showed you before, you can do that here. Um, and then over here, we have a chemical that was drawn in ChemDraw. Let's say I want to highlight this particular functional group. I would select it all and then recolor it to um, red as shown here. So there are aesthetic things that you can manipulate in your um, each of your data sets. However, uh, keep in mind, do not manipulate your data using Illustrator. Like this is only for aesthetic purposes. Don't try to fudge your data and because that goes into the unethical um, territory. This here is another example of what you can do um, as a completed figure. Uh, yeah, so this is a figure I made during my PhD where I wanted to compare between different systems of the kinetics of the, these, uh, the, same uh, the same systems in different equipment, pretty much. Um, and they all had the same uh, time uh, points, but I thought it was a bit redundant to keep repeating it. And it would be cleaner if I just removed these ones. So all of these graphs are made in Excel. And then because there's guidelines, grid lines to guide your eye, you can still see that um, uh, correlated back to the time points. But it's all a lot cleaner and easier to compare the um, kinetics between each different system here. Uh, finally, I was also able to delete all the excess uh, legends, make one final one down here and resize it because you can't exactly resize the um, legends in Excel. So here it's a lot clearer to see the information by just manipulating it a bit with um, Illustrator. And then I also added in the labels, so A, B, C, D. Right. So one final and very useful tool that you can use in Illustrator is making phospholipid bilayers. So we in the Controlled Release Society, we work quite a bit with um, cells and uh, lipid-based nanoparticles. So, and using phospholipids in general. So we can quickly make these kind of um, bilayers by using the tools that we've learned previously. So I'll make, remake it again over here. Very briefly, if I select the ellipse tool, I can make a circle, right? So if I hold the shift key, 
I'll make a shape here. Currently filled black and no outline, but I want to change this to let's go pink as well. And then change this from transparent color. Double click this and I want to change it to come close to black. All right. Now I'll select the paintbrush tool and I'm just going to zoom in a bit so it's a bit easier to see. Draw my hydrophobic tail like so. And this is one of my phospholipids. Now I can select all of this and group it. So control G and then I'm going to move it down holding the Alt and the Shift key to, keep, to copy it and keep it in alignment. Now I need to rotate it. So again, hover my cursor over one of these um, anchor points or one of these bounding box, box, white boxes. Click, hold, drag and move it around. Hold the Shift key to lock it to certain angles. And now I've got one section of my lipid bilayer. I will highlight all of this now. And we'll go into this next section over here. So I'm just going to quickly go through this and then I'll do a demo run of the actual steps. So once you've got your shapes made, you select it all and you drop and drag it into your brushes tab. So right now mine's not really activated. Again, you can go via window if it's not there, but I'm going to click onto it. And then you drag the whole thing into this box over here. And then the scatter brush, I mean, and then this dialog box will show up where you'll select scatter brush and click OK. Then this box will show up where it, it will ask you, um, what do you call it? Uh, where the only thing you need to change is the rotation relative to from page to par. Once you're done with that, you find a shape, you select your brush and then it'll make this weird shape. But don't worry, you select double click your shape again uh, you double click your brush again and then you will see um, you can toggle with the um, settings and the parameters whilst the preview box has been ticked so that you can see live changes to your shape, um, the spacing and the, sh uh, the arrangement of your lipid bilayer and once you have it perfect to your liking you press OK and then it'll come up with a warning then you'll press apply to stroke and you're done. So I'll show you all of that in action now. We'll go back to the shape that we've just made. I will select it all using the selection tool. Click and drag it into here. So notice how it's a plus there, means you can drop it here. I'll click OK for the scatter brush. And then for now, all I need to do is change it from page to path. And then click OK. So now I'm going to go back to our original shape that we had up here, with this circle, for example. All right. So that's my shape, it's been selected, and I'm going to select the scatter brush that I just made. It's very ugly. However, if I double click on this, the same setting box will come up. And as long as I have this box ticked, I can adjust these values until I get more appropriate, so that looks like an okay size. I will decrease the spacing. So it's at 10% now, but I'm going to keep going until, yeah, that looks about right. You can also toggle with the um, scatter and rotation if you need to, and you can also make it random. This is all something that you can play around with in your own time, but there's different effects that you can make. And then you, once you're done and you're happy, and then this warning comes up, you only need to click apply to strokes. And then there you have it. This is your liposome. Pretty neat, right? right? So that was the last skill that I've got to teach you. Uh, we'll move on to actually saving your data now. So, uh, like I said previously, if you had a large, um, artboard or canvas to work with, now's the time once you've finished it all to resize it to um, something more appropriate. So to do that, you would press this button here 
So this is the artboard tool. Now you've got a box around your canvas and you resize it to the um, appropriate size of your figure. And then you would press escape and this will be done. And this is where it would save. However, I'm just gonna control Z that. But yes, uh, that's how you resize your canvas. Once you want to save it, you need to save two different files. One is the editable one. And this is the one that will allow you to um, uh, edit, modify your work again if you need to. So for that, you would go to file and then save or save as. And then you would change the different file um, type. So ideally you would choose Adobe Illustrator Otherwise, you can also choose PDF and some journals will ask for an EPS file. This is where you find that type of um, file type. And then once you're done, you press save. And, then, um, and that's it. Um, and then this box will come up as well. Uh, you don't need to mess around with any of these. You can just uh, click, keep it as okay and it's done. And then it goes through the whole saving thing. And then the next one you want to save it as is a publishable uh, type. So this is your um, something that if you want to use it on your Word document or if you want to email it to someone, you'll need to put it in a format that they can open it in. So for that, you would go to File, Export, and then Export As. From here, you would pick either TIFF or PNG or JPEG. So PNG is if you have, if you want a transparent background, but otherwise TIFF is pretty much the standard one. Uh, JPEG loses quite a bit of quality. So if I pick TIFF, I would rename it, I would go export. And then here, once again, you can change it, uh, the color mode and the resolution if you need, if you need to, and then you press okay, and then it does its thing. But yeah, that's pretty much it for saving. And that's pretty much it for this course as well. Um, so I'll refer you to these two um, resources. So Aira Zabala from University of Cambridge has designed this really um, detailed and effective um, course on designing more effective scientific figures. Uh, so please go check that out. And also Kevin Bonham has developed some uh, videos on his YouTube channel for um, scientific specific um, uses of Adobe Illustrator. And they're pretty useful as well. And finally, thank you for listening and joining us. Um, once again, please remember to register as a CRS member for more benefits. We can't always guarantee that uh, these courses will be made available to all of you so freely. So um, please do consider joining us and at the uh, virtual annual meeting as well. Please follow the CRS um, science Twitter for more information and to also remember to follow us on our um, social media. Uh, I'd also like to thank our sponsors, um, CureVac, who have been a great help in supporting young scientists um, in the Controlled Release Society. All right. uh, so now we can uh, go through any questions that you guys might have in the last couple of minutes. In this session, where's the chat function? Thank you so much, Linda, for that amazing presentation. Um, I'm pretty sure everyone would have found it really useful. So yeah, we do have some questions coming in. Mm -hmm. uh, has raised their hand. Yeah, we can. Uh, Hello. Links will be up eventually on the CRS forums and um, along with this presentation as well and a recording of it too. So we'll, go, we'll let you all know via our social media when that is available. Uh, uh, hi, Linda. Yes. Uh, I had one doubt regarding the uh, importing the files. And like you said that we can modify the elements of the graph if we import it through Excel or say prism files. So you told that we can edit the elements like the access titles and everything. So my question here was like, do we need to import it or even the copy paste from the, uh, say the copy prism paste. file or the Excel? 
copy paste will also mm-hmm. do so if, if i copy paste yes. also then also i'll be able to edit all the elements separately yes that's exactly it um so just find any other program uh click on it control c or copy right click and copy and then you paste however if you pasted if you copied your graph from excel and pasted it into word but then copied it from word into illustrator it will you won't be able to ac- uh, uh, edit the uh, elements individually okay so you need because to uh, yeah mm-hmm. yeah thanks Linda. because the problem that we face is that while making a panel we have this graphs of different sizes uh, you know like based on the data and the content of the graph the graphs have different sizes but the titles and axes need to be consistent for all the graphs in the panel so that is the problem that i generally face mm-hmm. while designing a panel yeah yeah so this yeah. will easily allow you to um, yeah. make everything more consistent and that's okay awesome. yeah so that that was the only query yeah thanks linda mm-hmm. thank you so much no problems yeah. Um, what other questions? Wait, mods, do we have any major questions that you have compiled that we haven't answered yet? Um, how you make the, may I ask how you make the preview window appear after the phospholipid has been added to the brush? You just double click the, um, the the brush again so over here if i just um so this is the graph that i the brush that i want to edit i just double click it and then the preview button the preview tick will come up um if you first make the brush it won't appear at all so yeah it's pretty much it it'll only appear after you've already made the graph can you draw a curve with the pen? Yes. So if you want to make um, a curvy line, you can do that too. So there are two ways you can do that. Yeah. So I'm going to make my weird shape. If I want to make this corner curvy, I would go up here. So there's a convert button where I can make sharp or rounded corners. So I just click onto whichever point I want, and then I change it to the, um, the uh, smooth anchor. So I, to do this, I would click the um, direct selection tool, click on the point, and then click on the curve tool. So yeah, uh, and if you want to edit it again, so this is a bit more clear, I will select my point, shift it however I want. Oops, that's a bit too much. Um, and move the handles if I want to change the curvature. Yeah, it's very neat. Um, otherwise, there's the curved um, curvature tool. This one is pretty much like the um, pen tool. However, it makes only curved lines. So I make, I click first, and then I click the second point. It looks like a straight line yet, but it hasn't really um, finished. So I just curl it around, and let's say I want to click here so it's there's all guidelines here for you to actually see that um it will round off and everything so if i pull it over here the curvature up here will look a bit different whereas if i go over here if i want to curl it this way any which way i want and then to close it off again i would just select that button and that's what it looks like yes uh Yes, you can do that. Uh, if you want to add text that will follow a curve, there is definitely a way you can do that. And I've watched many tutorials, but it's never stuck with me on how to do it. Uh, <laughs> I think it was something like, if you make a shape, I think if you press the T, no, okay. There are definitely tutorials you can uh, help you do this. Um, I haven't quite mastered how to do it yet, or I haven't quite remembered how to do it yet. Um, but yes. Oh, 3D objects. <laughs> so you can do 3D objects here. Um, it just takes a bit of time to actually, um, you need to have a strong computer, otherwise it will crash. So I wouldn't recommend it for um, those who are, 
still, um, what do you call it? If you have big projects with this, but basically let's say I've got a square, I would go to effect and then you go to 3D. I would go to extrude and bevel. And from here, ooh, I'm gonna press, hopefully this doesn't scroll it up. Yeah, I just press extrude, I mean preview, and then I can adjust it however much I want. And then it's done. All right, guys, um, thank you so much for attending. Um, I gotta head out now and yeah, hopefully you all can join us for our next Back to Basics class, but thank you so much. Um, I'll leave it to our mods to, and host, as Anthony, to uh, finish it off. But yes, thank you everyone. Thank you so much, Linda. See ya. Um, so if there's any um, burning questions, you can ask now, otherwise we'll be ending this meeting in a couple of meeting, uh, minutes time. Um, we're still working, so this session has been recorded, but we're still working on um, how we can get this accessible to everyone. So um, look out for your emails, we'll possibly email it or something like that. But yeah, we'll let you guys know. Cool. I guess, um, yeah, we'll end it here. Um, please follow our social medias to um, stay updated on our um, upcoming sessions. Um, thank you so much for joining us. I hope you really gained some um, valuable knowledge out of this and hope to see you all in our next session. Um, thanks a lot. Take care and stay safe.